Hello and welcome back. First let me thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady. And now let's continue with measure theory, namely with part 6. And we will finally talk about the Lebesgue integral, but first about the Lebesgue integral of so-called step functions. So we will learn how to integrate functions that are defined on an abstract measure space. As a short recap, a measure space is nothing more than a dribble. There we have a set x, a sigma algebra a and also a measure mu. This means that x could be any set. But a is a special collection of subsets of x. And the third ingredient the measure mu itself is indeed a map, where the domain is the sigma algebra a and the codomain is the interval included zero and also included the symbol infinity. Now with respect to this abstract measure space, we want to integrate some special functions. Indeed what we need are measurable maps defined in the last video. I will use the letter f for such maps that start with x and go into the real number line. Now you should not forget that we have a sigma algebra on the left, namely a, and also a sigma algebra on the right. And there we have the Borel sigma algebra. Also recall that measurable means that all the pre-images from elements from the sigma algebra here lie in the sigma algebra A. In other words, pre-image of a set E is in A for all Borel sets E. Okay, so these are the functions where we want to be able to integrate them in the end. However, at the moment they might be too complicated, so we start with functions that we already know. For example, we already know that the characteristic function is a measurable map if we choose a measurable set. This means A lies in the sigma algebra. We already know how to sketch this function. If we have our abstract x here on the line and maybe this is the set A, so these two things together are A, then we can sketch the graph of our characteristic function. It will be 0 here and has the value 1 where the set A lies. So here it will be 1 and here also 0 and there also 0. For a visualization of the integral it's always good to see the integral as the area below the graph and the x-axis. Here this would mean we look at this area here and the area here. And because the value of the function is just one, it does not matter how abstract this whole measure space is, this area should be exactly the same as the volume, the measure of the set A. Or in other words, a meaningful integral notion, and maybe let's call it just by capital I, of this characteristic function should always fulfill that this integral is the measure of the set A. Now we have a new symbol on the left, i of a function, so you should read this indeed as a definition. This means now you know how to integrate characteristic functions. In fact there are other functions where we can define the integral also in such a simple way and these are called simple functions. There are also a lot of other names that one uses for such simple functions. For example step functions as I did in the title of this video and also staircase functions and also other names. And here you see the name might not be important you just have to know what such simple functions are. In short, a simple function f is just a linear combination of such characteristic functions. This means you can write 
f of x as a sum yeah, where we start with 1 and go to a fixed n and where we have numbers ci and characteristic functions corresponding to some measurable set ai. In other words, a function f is called simple if you can find measurable sets a1 till an and real numbers c1 till cn such that you can write the function in this form. Because we know that the characteristic functions are measurable and also sums of measurable maps are also measurable, we also know that this simple function is therefore measurable. Also here I would say to get some visualization let's sketch the graph of such a simple function. This is the same as before, so we have x here and r here. And maybe here now we have a set a1 and here a set a2. And let's choose a split set a3 here. And for these sets we can now choose some constant ci. Hence we have for the graph of the function some value here over a1 another value over a2 here, and maybe a lower one here for a3. And outside of these sets we are just at zero. If we now go back to our visualization of the integral, we know it's given by rectangles. For example here we have the rectangle with length given by a1 and the height given by c1. Therefore this rectangle here just represents the part of the integral that is given by c1 times the measure of a1. And the contribution for the integral given by the set a2 is just this rectangle here. And of course now given by c2 times the measure of a2. And then the last part is coming from a3 which consists of three parts but in the sum, of course, this is also c3 times the measure of a3. And now you should see that we just have to add up all these contributions to get the full integral, to get the full area in this picture. Hence, again, for a meaningful integral definition, we need a sum of all these parts. So i of f is then given by a sum. And there I have the same ci as before, but now not the characteristic function, but the corresponding measures of the sets. And indeed, this will be our integral for simple functions in the end. However, at the moment, you should see immediately one problem with this definition. What happens if we have a set with volume infinity? so that this number here is the symbol infinity. There we could have, for example, 3 as the c times infinity. Maybe that's not a problem for you because it's just infinity itself again. But then what happens if the next c here is minus 2 and the measure is also infinity? And of course, this is not simply just one infinity. This is not defined at the moment. In fact, we have a problem with the definition in general. In order to solve this problem, there are essentially two ways one can go now. On the one hand, one can restrict oneself to such simple functions where the corresponding AIs only have finite measure. Obviously then there is no problem with such infinities because there is no simple infinity involved in the whole sum. And on the other hand, one can demand that these constants have to be positive. Then there might be infinity in the sum, but only with the same sign. And then of course we don't have a problem adding up positive infinities. And exactly this second possibility is the way I want to go here. Now finally we can put the integral into a definition. For this we will consider now just functions defined on x. 
And as before, there should be step or simple functions. Moreover, we want now to consider only the positive ones, or more concretely, the non-negative ones. The whole set of such functions is now denoted by a curved S, where I put in a plus. And this S plus is now almost a vector space, in the sense that we can add functions as we want, but we can't scale them as we want. Because only positive scalars are allowed, otherwise we would leave this space. So you should imagine this as a half space. If we go now back to our definition of a simple functions, you immediately recognize that this representation here is not unique for the function f. For example, we could split the set a2 into two parts, and then we have one term in addition in the sum here. But it does not change the function f itself, so the graph looks still the same, just the sum is different. Therefore, another description which is independent of this representation for a simple function would be I have a measurable function and it only takes finitely many values. In this case, I can always find such a representation here. The idea is now always choose a suitable representation for your simple function f. In our case here, if f comes from our s plus, then choose the representation as always, so we can write it as a sum, but now where the ci's are also non-negative. Of course, if the function is non-negative, then we can always choose such a representation. And now it's very easy to define the Lebesgue integral. So this is our new notion. And of course, often we will ignore the Lebesgue and just speak of the integral, yeah, because this is the integral we define here. And to be more concrete, we also would say with respect to our given measure mu. And this integral is now given as we already know, and also denoted by i of f, where we just add up the measures of the sets ai, where we scale them also by the ci's. So we have ci times the measure of ai. And because the ci are non-negative and the measure itself is non-negative, or in the worst case, just infinity, we know this integral is now also in the interval 0 to infinity, where we include both parts. One fact I can give you immediately, this definition for the integral is a well-defined object. This means that it does not depend on the chosen representation for our simple function f. So if you choose another representation with this property, you get the same number out. Maybe this is a thing you could try to prove. However, of course, the visualization should be the important thing. So it does not matter how you split up these rectangles here. Yeah, the sum or the sum of the areas should be always the same. No matter how you split up these sets here on the x-axis or you split up the c values on the y-axis. In other words, it makes sense that this integral here is indeed well defined. And finally, I can give you the usual notation one uses for the integral. Of course, an integral sign, where we put the set x here, then comes the function f, and then the measure mu by d mu. Sometimes also a variable is needed, and then the notation looks almost the same, so you just include a variable name for the function, so a lowercase x here, and then d mu x. So, this is the Lebesgue integral for step or simple functions. The idea is now that we expand this definition such that we can also integrate more complicated functions. But before we do that, let's first look at some properties this integral has. Firstly, it is almost linear. I already told you we almost have a vector space for our s plus 
and in this sense it's linear. We just have to restrict the scalars to non-negative numbers. And then we can pull out the addition sign and also the scalars. Hence this equality holds for all simple functions fg and for all scalars alpha, beta, greater or equal than zero. And of course this immediately comes from this sum here. Also by using a we can now show that if we have a step function or a simple function that is always bigger than another one, so we have f less or equal than g, then also the area between the graph and the x-axis should be bigger for g than for f. And of course this is what the integral tells us, so i of f is also less or equal than i of g. And this is what one calls monotonicity. In fact, this monotonic behavior is what we now can use to expand our definition to general measurable maps. In order to get a visualization, let's sketch again a graph. Now this is the graph of some measurable map, which is not a simple function as you can see. Now the integral should be now again represented by the area below the graph and the x-axis. However, we only have this notion for the moment for the simple functions. And as you know by now, a simple function has only finitely many values. And this blue graph here shows you there are infinitely many values. The whole idea of the Lebesgue integration is now to approximate the function by finitely many values. So I just choose some values here on the y-axis such that the whole graph is in some sense covered. And now the idea is to define a suitable simple function. Therefore maybe I choose this interval here and look what happens to the values of the function there. And now you see we have two parts that are mapped to this interval here. For the x-axis this looks like this, so we have this part here that ends here and we have this part that starts here and also ends here. This means we have one part of our set here and the other part here. And of course this should be our set that we usually call AI. So this is just one AI and the corresponding C you find now here, so this would be our CI. So I chose the lower part of the interval because then our step function is also below the graph of the function. So this would be the value of our step function here. And now you see all the other values on the y-axis give us the other CIs and also the corresponding AIs. Therefore, with this decomposition of the y-axis, we get out the usual step function, where we have our ci's there, and the so-defined ai's, where we have the, now the characteristic function here. So this is a new simple function, which I should call h now. And the important part is that h itself lies always below f, so always below the graph that is blue here. Therefore, if we want to contain the monotonicity in the general integral, we now have an estimate for the real integral value of the function f. We know that the integral of this step function is smaller than the real integral. And this gives now rise to the following definition. Hence, we choose a positive, or better, a non-negative function f that is defined on our measure space x. And of course it should be measurable. And now for each decomposition of the y-axis we can choose such a um, step function or simple function h that lies pointwisely below the graph of the function f itself. And if we choose the function h out of the step function that are positive or non-negative, so our s plus, we know we can look at the integral of this h. What we have is then a whole set of integral values where the only condition is that our step function is always below the real function f. 
the general idea is now, okay, so this integral value for the step function is always smaller than the actual integral value for the function f. And we should get closer and closer to this value if we choose a finer and finer decomposition of the y-axis. So we approximate something with the set here. And of course, this should be the supremum of the set. In fact, this is what we choose as the definition of the integral for our function f. So we have f d mu and also this is our measure space x. So the integral of a non-negative measurable map f is given by the supremum of all integral values for step functions that lie below the function f. And that is now the definition of the Lebesgue integral. And we also see this is well defined. The supremum of a set in the real numbers always exists. In the worst case, it would be infinity. Therefore, in addition, we also have another definition. F is called mu integrable if the integral is finite. So it's not the symbol infinity. And there you have it. This is our result for today. The Lebesgue integral in complete generality, because you see the only thing we needed here was a measure space x. So we only needed to know how to measure the volumes of these sets on the x-axis. However, what we used is that we map into the real numbers. So indeed, here we have r on the y-axis. Therefore, we can do this decomposition. We can't do this decomposition on the x-axis because there is no order, there is nothing more than just the measure. But on the y-axis, we can do it. Now, you should always keep in mind the Lebesgue integral is just defined with a supremum where we use simple functions to define the integral first. So, this was a long video today and I hope you learned something here. Of course, we had to define a lot of stuff. But in the end, you saw it is just a simple function where we can write down the integral immediately and then the general integral is just an approximation concept. In the next video, I will continue with the Lebesgue integral and also write down a lot of properties we have for it. And afterwards, you will finally see why the Lebesgue integral is so powerful. Then have a nice day and see you next time. Bye.